Okay. Hi guys, welcome back to our 23rd episode of Washington Nephrology Renal Pass Series. Um, we initially had Dr. Gott here, uh, and unfortunately he was unable to make it. So I am here with our star second year fellow, Dr. Pooja Kulwal. Thank you for joining us for the discussion. Thank you. Pooja, can I ask you very quickly, mm -hmm. what was it that made you want to go to nephrology? Um, I think probably the electrolyte abnormalities. I was interested in it first as a fourth year med student when I did a nephrology rotation. And we had all these sodium disorders that we were able to correct just with like some calculations and that was fascinating to me at the time. So awesome, awesome. That's where it started. Okay. And um, so I just have a quick plug before we start to uh, look into the nephrology social media internship if you're interested in um, advancing your social media skills. The internship is accepting applications now until January 1st. Um, so please check that out and please go to NFJC to look at the online journal club. So I'm going to start with a case presentation. 75-year-old um, female, abbreviated history here, relatively good health, no chronic medical conditions. She presents initially with shortness of breath, unintentional weight loss of 12 pounds over the past month. She's not on any uh, prescription medications and does not take any over-the-counter medications. Okay. Um, so pretty straightforward history in the beginning, at least with regards to past medical. Her first set of labs show a BUN of 38 and a creatinine of 1.5. Now her baseline from two years ago, which was the last time she saw a doctor, was 1.1. Her initial urine shows one plus protein, three plus blood, and a ratio uh, shows 650 milligrams per gram x-ray shows bilateral ground glass infiltrates. There's a little bit more and then I'm going to ask you kind of your differential. So initially she is started on broad spectrum antibiotics with the thought that she has pneumonia but she does not improve and receives a bronchoscopy which reveals alveolar hemorrhage. Um, she's pretty stable though from a pulmonary standpoint she's just on the floor. Renal function at this time also remains stable with good urine output and we send for serologies but before they're back a kidney biopsy is done. So as we go into the histology, Pooja, let me just ask you, what do you expect to find in this patient given this, um, these, this kind of uh, initial presentation? So I guess on my differential for renal, um, uh, I guess GN issues uh, that might arise, it sounds like a nephritic picture um, with the hematuria, the subnephrotic range, proteinuria, and, um, and she has now diffuse alveolar hemorrhage and that would make me think of like an ankyovasculitis or an anti-GBM okay. um, process. The ankyovasculitis is probably higher up with her age range. Mm -hmm. um, the unexpected weight loss, however, is concerning for maybe some occult malignancy and maybe the alveolar hemorrhage is just related to the pneumonia and so something like, um, oh, I don't know, like a membranous, although there was some blood and that would be less likely, it would be on the differential. And um, I guess that's where I would start. Okay. Good. Yeah. So you know, this is a I think a pretty classic pulmonary renal yeah. syndrome. So you know, the vasculitides and or anca or, or posse immune um, anti GBM disease. I think just for completion, one of the, some of the other diseases that we can throw in that would can cause a pulmonary renal syndrome, uh, which are lower on the differential here, would be like lupus, uh, cryoglobulinemia, and so forth. So let me ask you, um, when you're looking at this biopsy with your top two differentials being ANCA and NIGBM, how are you going to tell those two apart? So on the light microscopy with the ANCA, we might see um, crescents mm -hmm. or uh, I guess you might see segmental scars also, but less likely. Mm -hmm. um, I think really it's just going to come down to the, I, uh, the IF. Okay. where. ANCA would be posse immune, so there would be nothing on the IF, and anti-GBM would be a grand, uh, linear staining of anti-GBM. Great. Um, okay. That's exactly right. So um, I think the teaching point is there's a lot of overlap with the light microscopy findings for those diseases. Mm -hmm. So crescents you mentioned, um, uh, activity would probably be any cariorexis, fibrinoid necrosis, things like that. Segmental scars would more imply a um, chronic process, mm -hmm. which if you're catching it late, we might see too. So let's just jump to the histology. Um, why don't you tell us what we're looking at here? So this is a low power trichrome stain. Um, we're looking for, I guess, chronicity mostly. And it does not seem like there's too much interstitial fibrosis based on um, just what I see between the tubules. They look pretty back to back and there's not too much of the, 
I guess, blueness that we refer to usually. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few glomeruli, one, two, three, four, maybe five. Um, and I think, I can't quite say if there's globally, if there, maybe one is, I don't know, I can't really say if they're yeah. globally scrossed or yeah, not, this power. power. I'll, I'll give you some higher power images, <laughs> but I think you're spot on here. You can, you can at least uh, assess that there's, this, there's not a lot of chronic disease. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of fibrosis. We don't see a lot of blue. Um, and we can probably comment on that this is a, an adequate sample of kidney, but we need some higher power, and that's what you're going to get next. Okay, so this is going to be um, an h and &E stain, and we have two glomeruli, and then um, there's a lot of tubules. And uh, just looking at the interstitium, I guess first, the tubules also look back to back here. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see any flattening of the tubular epithelium to suggest like an ATN-like mm -hmm. process. I don't see too much or any inflammatory infiltrate really, um, or dilated tubules. Um, there is, I, I'm guessing that's like the proteinaceous stuff inside the lumen, like yeah. maybe seven o'clock. To yeah, nine o'clock. Uh, you mean within the tubular lumen? Within the tubular lumen. Yeah, I'm not sure if those are just hyaline casts okay. or something. They don't quite look like RBC no. casts to me. Um, and then looking at the glomeruli, so um, no uh, crescents or okay. segmental lesions um, okay. that are noted. And then as far as the capillary loops, they appear open. Um, I don't see much uh, mesangial hypercellularity. I don't think there's any region where there's more than three nuclei per like area of mesangium. Mm -hmm. Maybe some expansion, but that looks like it might be closer to the poles where I see some increased mesangial, I guess, like mesangium just in the area. I'm not sure yeah, uh, if so I can point, point it out. out here. So you're talking about like in this area here? Mm -hmm. yeah. or, or like a little bit, maybe up higher. higher. Yes. Yeah, I think this is probably the hilum. Okay. Um, yeah, there might be a little bit of mesangial expansion there, yeah. but it, and certainly no uh, severe activity, like you said, no crescent. Right. Like that. Okay, let's give you a different stain. Okay. So this is a PAS stain, and we're looking um, again uh, the glomeruli appear pretty, uh, well, the loops appear pretty open, mm -hmm. and the thickness of the endocapillary base membrane um, is, I guess if I'm looking at that comparing to an adjacent, like non-atrophic tubule, it looks about the same. Yeah, I Not agree. Not too much normal. more yeah, thickened. Let me see if I can bring my mouse over without ruining this picture. I don't seem to be able to, so we'll just... Yeah, but I agree. If you look at the basement membrane of the um, tubules and mm -hmm. compare that to the capillary loops, I would say they look about the same. Um, I don't think there's any more information here compared to what we saw in the H&E. Great. &E. Great. Yeah, the PAS just highlights the um, epithelial brush pore of the tubules, and again, as you mentioned, there's not um, um, flattening or um, simplification of those uh, tubular epithelium to suggest ATN tubules look really pretty healthy here. Mm -hmm. In the absence of Dr. Gout, we just have to like say what we think we see and hope that it's actually correct. All right, here's another one. Okay, so this again is an H&E stain, and I guess this glomerulus, we got part of it. Um, but here I don't see that many open loops. Um, maybe some endocapillary proliferation. Mm -hmm. And then there's an area with there's just more eosinophilic material, like at 12 o'clock. So you're talking about this area? Mm -hmm. yeah, Which so I'm wondering if that's like fibrin, like fibrinoid necrosis or something? Yes. So I think it, it is. Oh. It's hard to tell on H&E, but okay. you know, this looks so much more red. I guess my question is, is that a crescent or is that a scar? Like, is that a segmental I don't know where it's starting, but if it's like an endocapillary loop that's now ruptured and then causing inflammation. Okay, um, we'll get we'll get back to that. Okay. What, what do you think this area here is like? What's all of that? If you had to um, n name this histologically, what would you call that? It's almost like the mm -hmm. uh, nuclei of the cells that were there just got crushed up and destroyed. Is karyorexis? Yeah, so this looks like karyorectic debris. Okay. Just nuclear dust of cells there, uh, kind of embedded within mm -hmm. this um, um, uh, 
area of fibrinoid necrosis. Okay. So your question of is this a crescent or is this so like a segmental? So maybe more of a segmental lesion. Yes. So, um, so I would call this a segmental necrotizing lesion. Okay. Yeah. So which is still active and still consistent with what you would expect to find in an ankylosteritis, in a GBM, right, etc. And I bet you, if you left this alone, it, over time, it would probably form a crescent. Okay. Okay. Here's another H and E. Okay. So here, um, again, we're seeing that same eosinophilic, eosinophilic material in the glomerulus, um, which we were thinking was fibrin. But I think here there is a crescent. Mm -hmm. It looks like there's expansion of the Bowman space inward, and then the glomerulus is more, I don't I wouldn't say collapse, it's just pushed over because the crescent is there. Right, yeah. Um, I think that's exactly right. So let's see if we can highlight that here. Again, so this is glomeruli. Mm -hmm. And this whole area here from about, you know, one o'clock down to you know, five o'clock is the crescent. Right. It's pushing on um, in, in, in Bowman space, uh -huh. yeah, and you have more areas of fibrinoid necrosis. Right, and then there's all this inflam inflammation surrounding. Yes, which I yes. guess would be expected. Yes, and that looks lymphocytic to me. All right, so let me give you one more stain. Do we know how many crescents per? I will tell you okay. that at the very end, or right before we. I'll tell you that right before we get to the IF. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is a silver stain. Um, and I guess I had mentioned membranous just because of the questionable weight loss, possible mm -hmm. malignancy history, but um, I mean, the, I see that the basement membrane, or the collagen which the silver stain would be staining is not really continuous. Yes, excellent, okay. Um, so, and then there's, I mean, I would think that maybe this is, um, another glomeruli that has a crescent and there's just so much inflammation and there's been a break in the glomerular basement membrane. Yes, yeah, that's exactly right. So it's not continuous, there are ruptures and breaks. So, you know, silver, we always talk about buzzwords like spikes right. and holes. And so spikes and holes correlate with membranes, mm -hmm. which we don't see here, but, you know, ruptures, yeah. breaks imply, you know, you know, exactly that rupture of the capillary loop. Um, and so if you compare this silver mm -hmm. to the H&E uh, beforehand, you know, I don't think it's the same glomerulus because the crescent appears to be in a different place, but they're kind of the same image. This is what a crescent looks like on H&E, and this is what a crescent would look like on silver because silver doesn't really stain the cells. Mm -hmm. But you can see all that stuff within Bowman space still, and even though it's not, you know, right. lighting up, this is, this is your crescent. Okay. Okay. All right, so you asked uh, rightly how many glomeruli mm -hmm. were involved. Why do you want to know that? Uh, to see if it's a crescentic GN, if there's greater than 50% glomeruli. Okay. So this is what we had, 18 glomeruli sampled, one was globally sclerosed, and three had active necrotizing lesions, mm -hmm. crescents, or karyorexis. So based on that... Can't really call it a crescentic GN. Okay. okay, so what's on your differential based on these light findings now? I think my differential still has ankylosteritis and anti-GBM okay. as the top. Good. So now I'm going to tell you the IF was normal, or okay. negative, negative. There okay. was no IgG staining, IgM, I just blank picture of IgG. Okay. So let's look at EM and then I'm going to ask you for your final diagnosis sure. here. So this is an EM. Okay. So to orient ourselves, um, I think in the middle we're looking at the endocapillary loop. Mm -hmm. okay. And so you see the that's the blood space that your okay. arrow is in, blood and space. then outside is the urinary space. And the podocytes look pretty well preserved. Yes, I would agree. Um, and then as far as the basement membrane goes, I don't really see any electron dense deposits. Mm -hmm. um, and then I don't see any in the mesangial area above either. So would you say this looks like a normal EM image? I would say from this picture, yes. Okay, I agree. So we just happened to um, sample a glomerulus or a capillary loop that wasn't ruptured mm -hmm. in this case because this is a focal and segmental lesion. Okay. Um, 
so we didn't have any in picture of a, a rupture or okay. um, a crescent. So uh, what would your histologic diagnosis be here? A posse immune glomerulonephritis. Excellent. Yeah. So this is a posse immune vasculitis. And um, I think the quick teaching point that I think we, uh, I, I, I want to make here is that even though this patient doesn't have classic crescentic GN, as you rightly said, not more than 50% of the glomeruli had activity, it's still consistent with a GN like anca vasculitis, posseumine vasculitis, and a GVM, et cetera. Um, and at least when I was taught in medical school, which um, is a while now, but we talked about RPGN types one, two, and three. And I never liked the, the, the classification of RPGN type one, two, and three, but it actually does make sense when you think about what is causing the crescent. So this is a slide that Dr. Jeanette, um, um, I borrowed from Dr. Jeanette. Uh, so when you have a crescent, it means the basement membrane has ruptured in some way. So if you have anti-GBM disease or good pastures, you have an antigen against the basement membrane itself. There can be a, a crescent from immune complexes. So lupus, I think, would be the classic example. But this mm -hmm. is also why we can see crescents in IgA nephropathy, or even in membranous. You can see crescent anything that will deposit there and rupture the basement membrane. And then, as is in this case, if your immunofluorescence is negative, we call that posse immune. The majority of those patients have anca vasculitis, but don't forget that there is a a minority, 10 to 15 percent of patients with posse vasculitis that will be anca Thank negative. Yeah. Um, that, so that's the case and the teaching point. You did a great job reading the Thank biopsy. Um, we'll be back with Dr. Gopp next time for a more challenging case. Pooja's off the hook for the harder case right now. Again, follow us here on um, YouTube at Washington Nephrology uh, uh, on Twitter, maximum underscore change. If you have suggestions for uh, videos that you would like to see, please just email me. Uh, Pooja, thank you so much for being our discussant. Thank you.